can hear you now. Yeah, we are good to go, Brian. Thank you. Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome you to the uh, Blockchain Association's Forum Second Annual Member Summit. Uh, it's 2022, so much has happened over the last the last year um, since our inaugural summit. Uh, and um, as as you all know, the the, the Blockchain Association Forum is is um, a, a very large membership group of, of national bodies around the world. Um, we all come together on a regular basis to um, talk about national policy, talk about international policy, talk about um, the current trends globally, uh, and I think. Uh, particularly given the, the regulatory changes over the last year, there's been a lot of changes across a lot of jurisdictions. So everyone's very keenly watching what's going on in other countries. So it'll be very interesting to see what uh, um, what the various panelists discuss with us uh, today. Um, obviously, we have a, as I say, we have a very, very large membership base now. Uh, it's a relatively new organization, but I think, uh, I think as Professor Nassim has said in the past, you know, the, the, um, uh, the interest that governments are taking in blockchain now, uh, the, the, the sort of level of seriousness uh, that, that uh, governments are taking has, has very much changed the landscape globally. Uh, it's much more competitive, um, and that means uh, both from the private sector but also from 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 the government side. So again, it'll be very interesting to hear because we have such a wide um, group with us today. It'll be very interesting to hear how they how everyone's positioning themselves um, in this global ecosystem um, of blockchain. Um, and also, of course, very, very interesting to see where um, the application of blockchain is is, is uh, um, developing in different territories and, and how that's diverging in different territories or, or, or whether it's one global sort of commonality. Um, so uh, I think uh, we're a tiny bit late. Um, so I think we'll go straight to Stephen McGaskill uh, from New Zealand. Welcome, Stephen. Um, be very, very... Great to hear your thoughts. Great, thank you so much, and uh, really appreciate being here. I um, represent the Blockchain New Zealand uh, um, organization as an executive council member, and I might you might be dismayed to hear that when it comes to policies in New Zealand, uh, particularly crypto policies. Uh, New Zealand's a bit behind um, in that New Zealand isn't really going to be the first country in the world to implement uh, crypto policies. And um, to me, that's that's something that New Zealand's actually doing well, because when it comes to policies, you don't, uh, particularly crypto related policies, you don't necessarily want to be the first to create those policies, because uh, if you're the first one creating those policies, uh, doesn't mean that you've gotten it right. And it's a lot harder to take po unwind policies uh, after they've been passed. And so um, over the last year, there hasn't been a lot of new crypto related policies. However, there have been a lot of uh, good things that are happening here. Um, if you look at other countries in the world, uh, for example, Canada, they had their first um, parliamentary review of crypto assets in 2014. Um, in New Zealand, we, we have the lowest adoption rate or one of the lowest adoption rates for crypto assets in the world. And uh, part of that, um, it, there, there's good reason to that. And part of that is, is New Zealand has a really great rule of law, uh, five and a half million people, uh, the banking systems a little bit more modern than the rest of the world. And so you often see crypto materializing in places that don't have the rule of law or don't have um, strong uh, uh, banking um, uh, or, or uh, good good banking um, in, in their countries. And so um, in, in New Zealand last year, there was the first a, a parliamentary review or inquiry into crypto. And it was looking into the, the future nature, impact and risks of cryptocurrencies. And the way that New Zealand uh, looks at policy is something that I think many countries could, 
could possibly learn from. And what they, they do is evidence-based. So they look at what's happened in the rest of the world. They look at data. They uh, look at policies that have gone well in other countries. And based on that, create policies that make sense in New Zealand. As a Commonwealth nation, New Zealand uh, is uh, does have rule, some semblance of rule of law here. And uh, so from that perspective, you know, well, we're never going to be a, a leader uh, creating crypto policy. Uh, but I think New Zealand is, uh, for the most part, going in the right direction in that um, a lot of the rules or a lot of what we have seen over the last few years have looked at how um, crypto uh, rules can fit within the current regulatory regime because the the regime is is more uh, rule of law there are a lot of things that make sense where they don't have to reinvent the wheel and so from that perspective New Zealand's doing quite well uh, we're not trying to rush into passing rules about things that people don't understand or don't know. And so from that perspective, I'd say it's, it's very positive and um, it's still ongoing. So um, the, the uh, last year there were thousands of uh, entries from the public. And uh, in addition to the parliament uh, getting responses um, from the public and, and looking at cryptocurrencies, we're also seeing um, regulatory agencies in the central bank, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, uh, taking in responses from the public around CBDCs. And um, so, so that's very much on, on everyone's mind. Uh, however, again, we're not trying to dive in uh, and make um, rules that don't really make sense. So uh, that's still ongoing. Regulators are still trying to make uh, sense of good policy in New Zealand. And uh, it will take a number of years before we start seeing things set in stone here uh, compared to the rest of the world. So uh, what didn't go well? Um, it's harder to say what hasn't gone well in New Zealand versus what we've observed in the rest of the world. And what we've seen not doing so well in the rest of the world is the travel rule. Um, and we see that as a potential privacy and data disaster waiting to happen. Uh, when the legislation started passing in other countries, uh, VASPs in those countries didn't have the ability to comply when that legislation was passed. And so the technology didn't even exist for companies to comply with the travel rule. And we're start seeing uh, from New Zealand's uh, observation that many different countries are trying to cobble these together in, in many different ways. And there's really no good standard, particularly considering that crypto assets are global and international. And uh, policies in one country might not make sense in another country, particularly around privacy uh, and data rules. And so uh, I, I really want to pose, you know, we want policies that are enabling uh, global surveillance state, or are we trying to create um, good rule of law and protect people's property rights and consumer choice? And you have to wonder when you start looking into things like uh, the travel rule, because um, we there's uh, consumers are waking up to their data and their data rights. And uh, I think people are starting to realize that they don't want one entity such as Mark Zuckerberg owning uh, or having access to all our data. And uh, so that is something that I think um, is something that really needs to be analyzed and understood uh, much better over the coming years, because I think there's going to be quite a bit of backlash and the entities that are going to be held liable for this are entities such as VASPs, because 
they are the ones that are managing customer data. And if you have um, legacy businesses like Target, LinkedIn, JP Morgan that have had data breaches, um, it's, it's not crazy to see that those data breaches will persist. And um, that's, that's really not data uh, that we want everyone to have. And so I, I think that there's definitely things that we can look at uh, around cons protecting consumer uh, privacy and uh, enabling them to have choice without um, uh, infringing there. So uh, what can we do better? And this applies to New Zealand. I also think it applies um, everywhere. And I think it's, it's important to understand that crypto is an evolutionary process. Uh, it's, we're not really going to have all the answers for, for many decades. And so trying to rush into uh, understanding um, or, or trying to rush into policies today may have problems tomorrow. And so uh, I think we need to continue uh, education across the board. Uh, policymakers, there, there's an, an enormous gap in uh, education in the crypto industry uh, amongst policymakers and also amongst um, traditional uh, financial services and uh, other businesses. So uh, I think trying to find common ground across multiple industries is a, a process that's going to take time. And I think part of that is as an industry, in the crypto industry, we can do a lot better with our definitions and the way that we go about um, explaining things to other people in other industries. And so this, this is a possible example. And a lot of people, you go around uh, and they'll say there are thousands of cryptocurrencies. There's tens of thousands of crypto assets. It's not really the case. I think we're doing a, a poor job by saying that and using uh, that definition, because I think if we break that down, we can find something that we can all have common ground or agree on. Rather than say that there are tens of thousands of cryptocurrencies or crypto assets, look at them as digital tokens. Again, this is a framework that uh, I've been using, but uh, there's an opportunity to really hash this out and, and work this out. But if we can all agree that there's maybe not tens of thousands of cryptocurrencies, but that tens of thousands of digital tokens, and of these digital tokens, there might be one, two dozen cryptocurrencies, and those are the Bitcoins of the world. Uh, another category of platform tokens or platforms, and those are the Ethereums and the Cardanos of the world. And then identify the application and data tokens. Well, yes, there are tens of thousands of those. And are they assets? Can you really consider them all assets or crypto assets? And, and I, I'm not so certain. And then, of course, you have digital tokens that are asset backed. I think those are probably the most clear cut. Uh, digital tokens that represent gold, dollars, uh, things like art. Um, those are things that I think we can uh, uh, agree on and apply rules that already exist to things like that. But um, one, you know, the, these definitions are still need to be worked out. And although we can create these definitions and have these specific buckets, should we have policies that relate to these specific buckets? Because a digital token can have multiple definitions, can fit in multiple of these buckets. And so this is where I go back to that evolutionary process that, um, you know, I don't think we should rush to uh, creating policies because we're still trying to have an understanding of exactly what the heck is going on here. Second one, I'd like to um, say, say that we need to work on, uh, I'm almost done here, and, and that is review policies in existing industries because cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, digital tokens are a direct response to over-regulation. The reason why 3 billion people are unbanked is because they've been priced out of the market. 
the the um, regulations that have existed have made it too costly for businesses to service a large portion of of the population, and they've been uh, denied basic financial services. And so, wh when and w when we look at um, policies in traditional businesses uh, or traditional industries. Uh, we see a lot of them come from things like rent seeking, special interest groups, and lobbying. And we're starting to see that in the crypto industry as well. Um, large entities within the crypto in industry are rent seeking and lobbying to, in some ways, stifle innovation. And is that really something that we want to bring to such a promising technology that, that has such an amazing impact on civilization? And I think when we start looking at policies um, in older industries, uh, I think we can start looking at how we can reshape them to fit where the world is going. Uh, there's a reason why a JPEG um, that's an NFT is $250,000 rather than an NFT that represents a, a house or an asset uh, in the real world. And a big reason why is we still need to uh, have legal precedent to recognize this digital asset as ownership of something in the real world, which comes, it does come through time, but there's also a lot of regulations that currently exist that make it very difficult to put uh, this digital and analog world together. And so I think looking at policies that already exist in other industries and looking at how we can rework them based in our new global environment will, will definitely help um, crypto assets and, and civilization as a whole. And then lastly, understand that the magic in blockchain is enabling digital property rights. That was why blockchain came about, is uh, it enabled scarcity, and, it, and this scarcity enables property rights. And by creating policies that secure those digital property rights, recognizing them, which we are starting to do in certain jurisdictions. For example, Singapore recently made um, uh, recognize NFTs as property. And so as, as long as we continue doing that, uh, I think we're, we're going to be in, going in the right direction. And so that's what I'd like to see uh, a lot more of is recognizing these assets as property and that will help certainly when it comes to things like theft. Um, you know, somebody can come and steal my car title, but that doesn't mean that they now own my car. Even so 12 somebody, minutes. Ah, yes, I'm, I'm done now. So um, I just wanted to point out that, um, you, you know, we need to continue recognizing crypto assets as property and uh, help secure rule of law. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, very much appreciate that. Um, uh, I think uh, now we have uh, a video, I believe, from uh, the Right Honourable Senator Andrew Bragg. Um, Andrew is a Liberal Senator from New South Wales. Um, he has a particular focus on, on, on creating jobs in Australia, and, and mm -hmm. only recently um, it seems the, the uh, Senate Select Committee uh, decided to sort of pivot its focuses from, um, from, from sort of more traditional um, uh, sectors to looking at things like digital assets um, as a means of doing that. What, what I find particularly interesting is that um, nearly 20% of Australians own cryptocurrency. So um, I think it'll be very interesting to hear what Andrew has to say. Uh, he Brian, can you, can you hear him? It's a great privilege to be with you. And I want to thank the British Blockchain yeah. Association for the opportunity to speak. That's died. Can't hear it now. Last year, the race to regulate digital assets in Australia really hit the straps. We became a leading jurisdiction because of the 2021 Senate inquiry into financial technology 
And as part of that review, we recommended 12 changes in Australian policy and law, 11 of which were adopted by the former government. The former government committed to a complete consultation on the licensing of digital currency exchanges or markets and a finalised consultation on a custody system for digital assets by the middle of 2022. In a speech to Blockchain Week for Blockchain Australia in Sydney in March this year, I called for these reforms and others to be consolidated into a package known as a Digital Services Act. On that same day, the Australian Treasury Department released a public consultation paper seeking feedback on the proposals and the options for licensing markets and establishing a system of regulatory custody in Australia. We did this because we wanted to election-proof our agenda. We wanted to make sure that the debate remained sophisticated because at the national elections on 21 May 2022, our government was defeated, as is the judgment of the people, and unfortunately, as a result of that, the country has now lost significant traction on positioning Australia as a leader on digital assets. Since the new Labor government came to power just three months ago, the government has shown little to no interest in digital assets. And I think this is very disappointing when you consider the amount of policy formulation which had been conducted in the last parliament. The Minister for Financial Services, Stephen Jones, said in August 2022 that, quote, our government is ready to start consultation with stakeholders on a framework for industry and regulators, end quote. This appears to be an admission that the government wants to start from scratch. The Senate committee, which I chaired last year, though, was bipartisan. And, of course, the Treasury processes have been run by a non-partisan departmental consultation. Australia is in, a midst, is in the midst of a race for consumer protection, capital attraction and innovation. The Albanese Labor government is commissioning another review rather than responding to the Treasury consultation on crypto markets and custody. It, it has hit the ground reviewing. Rather than getting on with business, it is starting from scratch. I believe that our government, the Australian government, should be releasing a draft bill rather than commissioning another review. Meanwhile, Australia's competitors are enhancing their regulatory systems whilst we run duplicative, endless reviews. After three months, the Minister, Stephen Jones, should be prepared to make a judgement. He should be prepared to make a decision which doesn't favour his favourite domestic vested interests. He should release a draft bill now. The draft bill would show how Australian consumers will be protected with capital requirements, key personnel tests, auditing requirements and a disclosure regime. Jones and Labor are failing Australian consumers. But the future failures, if they do emerge, will be on Jones's head and on Labor's head. The recommendations we released last October were largely similar to those put forward in an executive order by US President Joe Biden in March this year. There's no argument, there can be no argument that our proposals were not up to international standard. Biden's policy pronouncements followed ours. So we have been market leading in our recommendations. The only announcement that the new government and the new Treasurer have made since the election has been to clarify the taxation status of cryptocurrencies 
and to make it clear that these will not be taxed differently or they will not be taxed as foreign currency. Previously, though, this government has described all cryptocurrency as a scam. Meanwhile, the world progresses. In June, United States Senators Lummis and Jelly Brand introduced their Responsible Financial Regulation Act, which proposes a comprehensive set of regulations for digital asset markets, which subjects them to oversight by the CTFC and the SEC. It is now September 2022. And the roadmap for reform proposed by the previous government has been abandoned. The past few months have shown that as an emerging sector with 20% of the population owning some form of cryptocurrency or having done so in the past, the emergence of central bank digital currencies issued by states that do not share our liberal democratic values highlight the need for consumer protection. This is a race, of course, for capital and investment. It's a race for our country's future and our economy. As a result of the government's failure to progress and deal with these issues, I have taken it upon myself to propose and develop a private member's bill, which I call the Digital Services Financial Markets Bill 2022. This will be released shortly. If the government will not act, the Parliament must act. I may no longer be on the government benches, but I maintain an interest as the chair of the committee that made these very important recommendations. The bill contains a number of elements. I'd like to talk you through them and seek your feedback and insight. As foreshadowed by the Treasury consultation paper, this bill includes a licensing regime which covers crypto, asset, secondary service providers, which is divided into three categories, a digital asset exchange license, a digital asset custody license, and a stable coin issuance license. The rationale for the three or for these, these licenses is twofold. Firstly, by providing a rules and standards based regime, we give confidence to the consumer that their risk exposure is to be managed and on par with other financial services and products. Secondly, by providing regulatory certainty, this regime opens the door to greater investment and growth in Australia's crypto ecosystem and virtual economy in a way which allows the industry to evolve and innovate without short-sighted constraints. We achieve this with the licence provisions developed through consultation with industry. And they are minimum, minimum capital requirements, conduct regulation, segregation of customer funds, tailored, tailored and appropriate plans to protect consumer assets, requirements for key personnel to be based in Australia, disclosure requirements to the market and to government agencies, and record keeping and reporting. For a custody licence, requirements also include designation of key persons to be based in Australia and for proper auditing and disclosure arrangements. The Minister has responsibility for issuing licences, ensuring that the Parliament leads these reforms and regulators don't run the show. Under the Bill, ASIC has the responsibility of administering and enforcing their regime. ASIC, of course, is our securities and markets regulator. It's crucial that the industry comes out of the shadows into the light. The bill provides for transitional arrangements as the industry develops further and is slowly integrated in parts into the traditional financial services sector. In terms of stable coins, the bill details an issuing licence for firms. Consider the recent collapse of algorithmic stablecoin Terra in the US. Minimum reserve standards must be introduced. 
to ensure the stable coin issuers provide consumers with at least the minimum standard of consumer protection. It is with this in mind that the bill contains provisions which mandate that licensees hold in reserve the full amount of the face value of liabilities on issue in the form of Australian legal tender. There would be a demand deposit made with a bank uh, which could be used in the event that there was a problem. The Lummis Jelly Brand Bill has been a useful instructor in this regard and underlines the importance of international collaboration in setting global regulatory standards. I welcome the opportunities we've had to discuss this with our colleagues and friends in the United States. To that end, I recently travelled to San Francisco to attend the World Economic Forum's meeting on cryptocurrency and digital assets. One of the key issues that came out of those meetings was how we are best positioned to manage the risks and potentially the yet to be determined benefits of central bank digital currencies. And as the world moves on CBDCs, Australia needs to keep up with both the risks and the opportunities. In the final report last October, the committee recommended that the Treasury lead a policy review into the viability of a retail CBDC. On reflection, given the scale of the policy reform recommendations that we made, the CBDC recommendation was undercooked. I was wrong to recommend a retail CBDC without deeply considering the privacy and big state implications. There are numerous privacy issues which could outweigh the benefits and we should not have been as positive as we were. I note that the RBA, the Reserve Bank or Central Bank in Australia, has recently self-referred a CBDC inquiry, which I'll watch with great interest. The RBA recently said that it was questioning whether there was a use case for a retail CBDC, given the evolved nature of the Australian banking sector and payment system, of course. I remain unconvinced now that a central bank should be running critical economic and security policy like digital payments when their primary role is to run monetary policy. As public policy makers, what we need is more information about the risks of CBDCs and more information about their use. In a recent article in the South China Morning Post, it was reported that the Chinese central bank data showed that not only have more than 4.6 million merchant outlets accepted CBDC payments, but more than 261 million digital wallets have been opened, totaling 83 billion yuan or 12.2 billion US dollars. This is across 23 pilot regions in China. The EU one is currently in its pilot phase and cross-border payments are being trialled with the UAE, Hong Kong and Thailand. It is not currently available in Australia, but under its two-tiered approach, Chinese state-owned banks are primary disseminators of the EU one via digital wallets. If the EU one were to be introduced into Australia, these Chinese state-owned banks would be the main payment facilitators. Accordingly, in the bill, we have therefore deemed it necessary to have provisions requiring that these EU one facilitators or Chinese state-owned banks disclose data to APRA, our prudential regulator, and to the central bank regarding its use in Australia. In doing so, we are following a similar approach to the US, but expanding it. These government agencies are obliged to then provide a report on this data to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services and to the Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. The reason this Act specifically targets the EU one 
is because it is the first CBDC to be issued by a major economy. And China's financial influence is particularly relevant in the Asia-Pacific region. We need to closely analyse this development and this expansion in conjunction with wider developments in the CBDC space. We need to do that if we are to preempt the risks of currency substitution in the Pacific and privacy breaches inside our domestic market. Transparency is a big part of our solution. Australians should be free to provide feedback to Parliament on laws we are proposing. The draft bill I have released today is laid out with that purpose in mind. We are very focused on two things, consumer protection but also investment promotion. They are two sides of the same coin. I would love to hear your views on this draft bill. What do you like? What do you hate? What would help the industry and what would hinder the industry? Starting on Monday, I'll be seeking comments and submissions from the industry for the next six weeks, and I encourage you to have your say. Thank you very much, and I wish you a good conference. Well, that's a, a submitted video from uh, from Andrew Bragg, the Senator for New South Wales. Um, I think we are now going to have a break for just a few minutes. Yeah, we'll end the session. The next session starts 9.50 with Marcus from Finland. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you.